Hi, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Royal College of Physicians in London. My name's Dr. Sammy Batrawden, and I'm joined here by three really wonderful guests to talk about well-being in the workforce. Um, so my role, I'm probably less expert than uh, the three guests I have joining me, but I'm the co-founder of the Doctors' Association UK and the immediate past chair. Um, and the Doctors' Association, uh, Doctors Association UK advocates for the well-being of doctors and for the wider NHS. So perhaps if I could go first to uh, Dr Emma Fox. Hi, so I'm Emma. I am Vice President for Education and Training and Senior Censor here at the Royal College of Physicians. And one of the things that's really important to us is around well-being. And uh, this is about how we weave a thread of well-being in all that we do. And one of the things that we are launching, in fact, next week is our mental health and well-being campaign and resource. So um, this is very much about how can we look after ourselves, each other, and very importantly, what interventions can we put into the, the workplace, primary, secondary, and tertiary, to make our working life better. Hello everyone, I'm Alexandra Adams. I'm a fourth year medical student at Cardiff University, and I'm also the UK's first deafblind medical student. Um, and I guess I really advocate for better diversity and equality um, in the, the workforce um, and celebrating our diversity and encouraging more doctors with disability um, into healthcare. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Amandeep Sidhu. Um, I'm just a bloke for Watford. Uh, I'm not a doctor, unlike the, uh, my esteemed colleagues next to me. Um, I'm part of an organisation called Doctors in Distress, uh, which is a charity uh, that was formed last year. Uh, and is very much dedicated to reducing the prevalence of burnout and suicide. Um, it was actually founded um, due to a bereavement that I suffered. Uh, my brother was uh, a cardiologist and passed away in November 2018 and was also a member of this college. So um, uh, I have a very, very close affinity with this organisation and really you know, honoured to be a part of this panel and looking forward to some exciting conversation and uh, adding to some of the questions that we're going to get asked today. So uh, with that in mind, I'll hand over to Dr. Sammy to start off the proceedings. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Really excited uh, to talk about wellbeing. Um, so you can submit your questions live to the panel um, via any of the Facebook forums or social media or the RCP website. So please do send us your questions and I will put them uh, to the panel as they come through. Um, so to start with, guys, first question we have is... What's the best way to reach out to someone who we think might be struggling, but we aren't necessarily that close to? So I, I think the, the first thing is to notice. I think that if we are looking out for each other, hopefully we can notice if things are, people are out of balance, they might be struggling a little bit. And then it's, is, are you the right person to have that conversation? If it feels right and the, the space is right, then it may be just starting, opening up the conversation of what's, what's happening, what might be on your mind, or I've noticed that something's a little bit different. Can I help? I think it's then, you may not be the right person, and then it's being able to find the right person to uh, support that person going forward. I also think it's really important you don't always take it all on yourself. Um, and there is so much resource and support out there that you can then um, access. And part of that is knowing how you do that, and in part that's why we're launching this mental health and wellbeing resource next week. I think we almost need um, a shift in culture in the workplace, actually, because you know we need to have that sort of open-door feeling so that people feel absolutely comfortable with going to anyone in the workplace to say hey look I'm struggling or you know are you okay because I certainly think as a medical student I I don't necessarily know who to go to first um, and I think maybe it's because we feel that if we do go and ask for help or if we are struggling we'll be sort of put down or be seen as a negative thing so I think it's almost trying to become a more accommodating workplace and, and I just want to emphasize on, on your recent TED talk actually you talk about the empathy switch and you say you know you ask someone are you okay but that's a natural thing I think anyone does every day but then we don't actually step back and go oh hang on is that person really okay mm. so you ask them again and I just think it's that constant sort of um, open door policy really 
uh, and it, it makes people more comfortable to come to you. Yeah, I think, sorry, just to come in, I, I think that's a great comment there. And I think, I'm not a doctor myself, as, as we all know, but, you know, it's without doubt that there's a lot of um, stress and workload at the moment within our health systems. And I think, I think you put it very well in another session, Sammy, that that sort of double tap um, is a really, really important thing to do. I, I think just further to that, my, my, my comments would, and ad additions to that would be, I think certainly when approaching another doctor or peer or colleague at whatever level, whether that's consultant or an F1, um, I think a, a natural immediate response, and I think you talked about culture shift, you know, particularly is around, are you okay? And immediate response is, yes, that's perfectly fine. My advice to people is probably not to just accept that at face value, is to really certainly, you know, check in and do that double tap because I think that culture within the profession, which certainly, you know, is developing and moving in the right direction going forward, is one around showing vulnerability, um, showing humility, you know, ultimately with the, um, the aim of benefiting patients. So I, I think opening up more, communicating more to whatever level, and I think, I think you've raised some really good points, so I think that's really, really important to reach out to people who are probably screaming inside saying, I need help, you know, I'm really, really struggling. Um, just do that in a very, very sensitive way, I think, before escalating that to other people. That's, that will be my addition to that think question. that's where that role modelling is really important, so as someone perhaps more senior, that being able to show you're vulnerable, being able to share that actually this feels really tough, um, and perhaps talking more openly um, and being prepared to share stories, all of those things make it help create an environment which hopefully starts to feel a, a safe place to have those conversations because it's, it's really important if you're saying it's good to talk about where I'm struggling or if I'm really um, moving into a space of really feeling unwell then you, you need to make sure that you've got the, the safety net around people to, to pick them up and, and hopefully help and support them. I think you've picked, all picked up on something really important there. Um, it seems to have become almost a badge of honour for, for medics and in fact all healthcare staff to be, you know, I'm fine, things are really tough but I'm absolutely fine. And I think part of that, I know we're going to talk a, a little bit about resilience but I think a lot of people are, are, are too frightened to put their hand up and say actually do you know what, I am finding this really tough. And the problem is if sort of everybody, including your senior, says oh I'm fine, I'm resilient enough to deal with this, that makes it even harder to speak up. So I absolutely agree, we do need a culture shift and, and starting to talk about the fact that actually our jobs are really hard and they are getting harder in the NHS. Um, so I'm really excited to see what the RCP comes out with next week, but um, certainly I think we should all be aiming for a culture change, completely agree. Because I do think a lot of people do want to help people, just don't quite know what to do. Um, and you don't want to do the wrong thing but you want to be there to enable them to hopefully a lot of these things it's about how you restore back to health and it may be some reasonably simple measures but sometimes things are very complex and as I say you're not the right person to take it on and that's knowing how or where you can seek that support and there's a lot of good things in trusts now but often unknown people just don't know how to access so the more open, but you've got to have that supporting safety net around people, I think. Otherwise, you make potentially vulnerable people even more vulnerable if you surface something that they feel uncomfortable with, but they haven't got, um, it doesn't feel the right, it doesn't feel a safe environment to be having those conversations. Yeah. And I think you're so right. I think it's about setting a good example from now, from today, to show that you know anyone can go to anybody in the team. because. You know, as, as much as I don't want to think this, but there is a hierarchy in medicine almost. Mm -hmm. So if the seniors start, you know, sort of saying, actually, I'm exposing my vulnerabilities here, I'm having a bad day, and I'm asking someone about it, I'm, I'm looking for help, then people sort of, you know, following that direction, like medical students like myself, can say, oh, this is the normal thing to do. Like, we are able to go to other people, and we don't, we aren't superhumans, we're not robots. Um, and we can ask for help. It's a na completely natural thing to do. Yeah, it needs to be normalised. Exactly, be human. Culture. Yeah, I agree. Does anyone else want to come in on that, or shall we perhaps take another question? Yeah. So the only thing just to add there is, which is the story. So this doctor can, which is our social media campaign about role modelling, sharing experiences and stories and. Um, one of our censors, Rob Bright, has shared his story about having 
and living and working with depression. Um, and that's, it's very humbling, it's very powerful, but it also shows, um, I think, in terms of what others might take from that. And some stories will really resonate with you from different people and what you take away from it. So I think the sharing is really important. I, I would absolutely agree with that. I haven't read that blog, but I'm going to go away and read it. But I remember being an A&E registrar, and I, in hindsight, was completely burnt out. And I, I, I don't think I'd realised how bad things got. And I wrote a blog from another EM consultant, who, who I won't name, but he knows who it is. And I wrote about his story of burnout, and I just kept reading, and I was like, oh, my goodness, like, I'm in exactly the same place. And it just hit me. But no one had... No one has had that conversation. Like, I, hadn't, I hadn't met anyone else at that point that was willing to talk about it. And actually, you're so right. It's, it's common and we need to make it normal. So people sharing their stories, people saying, you know, we know over half of doctors are, are showing symptoms of burnout. In fact, there was a BMA survey that, that just came out today about it. Um, you know, we know this is happening and I, I agree. I think the more people that talk about it, the more normal it will become. Yeah, and, and actually in that case, I think that's how social media is an amazing thing because like you say you know writing blogs or putting putting it out there and saying I'm struggling and and then you realize actually you are in the same boat as lots of more people yeah, than you alone. think and you know I was in a similar situation where you know when I started blogging and, and started sort of um, talking about the discrimination the struggles I had as a disabled medical student I genuinely thought I was the the only person uh, disabled in, in you know in my medical school and I honestly didn't know who to turn to on a bad day because I knew that no one would really sort of empathise with me. But I put it up on social media and, oh, my goodness, literally from people from across the world, you know, be like, yeah, we're in a similar situation here. And it, it makes you feel so much more reassured. Yeah, and it's a shame, really, because we've seen... I mean, that's one of the real positives about social media. I and mean, we've got these now huge Facebook groups for doctors that have got, you know, 20, 30,000 doctors in, and that's, that's just crazy. But I think part of the problem <clears throat> is we've lost our physical spaces, and before, mm. you would just go to the doctor's mess. Like, when I was in F1, we used to go there, and there'd be someone there the whole time, and you could just grab a coffee, you know, a bit of toast, and just say, do you know what, I've just had this really awful experience, or, you know what, I'm having a really rubbish day, can I just bounce ideas off you or just chat and you could just offload and the camaraderie was there because you were all going through the same thing and I think we've really suffered as a profession and it's not just us it's it's you know healthcare staff across the NHS we've really lost those physical spaces and it's mean it, it's meant that we've lost those avenues for support I think mm. but that's yeah. one of the great things about social media that we are seeing these online almost doctors messes yeah. um, and and again they're a really good avenue for support. People want a sense of belonging, don't they? So I think people are perhaps finding it in different ways. But I do think physical spaces are very important and I think we probably need to think more about how we resurrect them. And it's not just about the doctor, as you say, it's about the multi-professional team. Because it's actually quite difficult to have safe clinical conversations when you're in the same canteen as all the, the, mm. the families and visitors. Um, and it is really important to be able to feel that you can connect. I think connectedness yeah. is so important. Mm. And how much easier it is to um, make a referral where you've been in a, a space and met someone and talked to them than it is where you've never, you didn't even know they were in the hospital. So I think there's something <coughs> really important about nurturing those spaces and preventing them becoming storage cupboards. Absolutely agree. Shall we? That's a really good discussion. I'm conscious we've taken one question. Shall we move on to another one? Is that all right? Um, so, okay. So, oh, I have some strong feelings on this, but I'll, I'll try and keep my mouth shut for a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on the word resilience uh, when it comes to well-being? Is it encouraging us to adapt to a bad environment? Shall I start, Sammy? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. So. <clears throat> So I think resilience is, it, it, it can be quite a nebulous word um, and it can be a very, very specific word. But from what I've seen and my experience of how it's used recently, it's, sadly, I think it's been used very much as an excuse by corporate environments to say, um, it is what it is, um, whatever situation you're in, deal with it um, and basically suck it up and get on with it. Now, I think in some situations, um, that may be the case. I think you know if, if people are um, 
and I don't discriminate, you know, F1's, you know, first day on the ward, you know, suddenly, suddenly you realise, wow, this is the profession that I've walked into and I'm due my lunch break in 20 minutes. Well, OK, well, we've got to be a bit flexible. I think when used in the right context, resilience is certainly an appropriate term and phrase. But I think where it's certainly misused is when there are fundamental issues with um, organisational process, organisational policies, and simply as, you know, taking one example like lack of resources, I don't think using the word resilience or offering resilience training, for example, is the right answer or the be all and end all. Um, if we take the case of burnout, for example, and I know that's something that's very pertinent you know, to, to some people on this panel and hopefully to some people watching here. Issues of workload have to be reduced first before you talk about resilience or mindfulness or anything like that. So I, I would urge people and certainly organisations to really think about the context in which terms like resilience are used. And certainly from my experience, you know, being nearly my mid-40s, which I know I don't actually look like that, but um, I'll wait for the compliments to come through on Facebook. Not a day over 30. Indeed, but I, I think for me, certainly, resilience is something that's built up over time. It's something that you develop, I actually think, from childhood um, all the way, you know, to, to, you know, to the days that we retire and, and live gracefully. So I think when organisations say we're going to go on some resilience training or understanding that a little bit more, I don't think it's something that, that really has a lot of value, uh, certainly from the examples that I've seen, but I'll be keen to hear some of your examples as well. Emma, Alex, do you want to come in on that? So, when I've been thinking about this recently, actually, and, and someone, someone called me resilient, um, well, many times, and when I look at the reasons for being called resilient, I think it's because of you know maybe the challenges that I face. So you know sort of being a patient or being discriminated or something, and and all those challenges, those obstacles, are negative things. So it almost implies when we say, oh, doctors have to be resilient, that the challenges are an acceptable uh, an acceptable thing. So it's almost suggesting that as doctors, should it's perfectly fine for us to be facing all the hurdles in a bad way. Um, but actually, we need to remove the challenges, the obstacles, and we need to grow the support systems. And then maybe we don't have to be so resilient. So it's really interesting. It, it can have a good and a bad side to, to the definition of that word. And I, I think it all depends on, like you were saying earlier, you know, what context you use it in. Do you mean in healthcare? Do you mean in well-being? And do you mean in general? Mm. Um, but it is it's interesting. So I think. It is how we use this language. I think we can get lost in the language of burnout, resilience, moral injury. And I think in some ways they can get in the way. They can become very pejorative. I do think we have some personal accountability um, for how we look after ourselves. Um, there is something about how can we bounce back? Where do we get our inner strength? How do we restore ourselves? You know, we don't always get the job we want. Patients can be very sick. Patients very dear to you can um, we c can die and it's about how can we restore ourselves in that context how do we look after our health but if you're talking about where you are having to bounce back because there are endless rotor gaps or absences or um, the workload is unreasonable then I think that that is where we're talking about the system needs to improve. We mustn't normalise the system being um, poor and getting it and not doing what it should do and then seemingly saying people are not resilient, they're weak um, because they are going off sick, because they are experiencing a horrible time at work. So I think it is about context. There is something about, yes, we do need to draw on our inner strength. How can we um, bounce back? But at the same time, we have got to do lots around how do we improve our working environment, our workplace, how we work with teams. And I think that that's where these primary, secondary and tertiary interventions come from. So the college is very much around those primary interventions, a real fo focus on workforce doubling number of medical students etc and then it's moving into how can I look after myself in that and there is something about when it's an awful system to work in I would say there's lots of really good stuff about the system as well is that how can we do more to look after ourselves or if we are recognizing we're struggling where can we um, where can we get more support or help how can we re-nourish ourselves 
avoided that like perfectly. That's what I was trying to sort of say earlier. But I think, yeah, you're right. I think in the context of resilience in terms of um, sort of uh, in the work, well-being in the workforce, we shouldn't have to be resilient because it, it's just a blatant excuse otherwise, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of you, especially what you were saying about the language we use and we have to be so careful. Um, so I, I was recently doing a debate about this, actually. Um, the motion was that resilience is rubbish, and I was arguing for, for the motion. Um, and I looked, looked into how resilience came about, and it started with this study in the 1970s, looking at children who'd come from broken homes. And the researchers were looking at these children, and a group of them, you know, didn't ever manage to escape their environments, but a small subset of them flourished. And they said, OK, well, this is the resilient group. What is it about these children that's different? But it wasn't looking at them as individuals. It was looking at their system and their support system, looking at their schooling, you know, the, the family they had around, it, around them. And it was that supportive and resilient environment which they looked at, and that's what they focused on. But I certainly don't recognise that as what resilience has become today and I, I do worry it's pejorative. I do worry that you know we've moved to individual resilience um, instead of it being a team sport. Um, and I do worry that it's, as you, as you quite rightly said, I, I remember you saying something once, uh, it's the NHS is a get on with it culture. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated with me because I completely agree with you. Um, and putting emphasis on, on, on personal resilience, uh, I would worry sort of negates the the duty of improving the systems that we're in. And, and you're right, we are all resilient as healthcare staff. Um, you know, we shouldn't have to be extra resilient to cope yeah, with all yeah. the system I think, I think if you're resilient as an individual, I think that could be quite powerful and it, it, it's quite good for yourself. But if a system is having to be resilient, then that is a sign that something is going wrong, I yeah. think. I, th I think I was just actually about to sort of paraphrase that. And I think, I think one piece of advice I would give to any doctor that faces a scenario where, let's say they were 18 hours and seen hundreds of odd patients and at the end of it, you know, medical director comes down and says, well, just be resilient because you've done it today. That means you can do it tomorrow. I would challenge that and say, well, okay, as well as me being resilient, fine. How is the system going to be more resilient and how does the process improve? So it, overall, you know, the entire healthcare environment in which we operate in becomes more resilient for the future and I would turn that challenge back and I think I think that's an appropriate challenge to do. I agree I think I think the term resilience isn't dead in the water but I think we almost need to reclaim it slightly so it's not just and you're right we do as a have a duty to look after ourselves as healthcare professionals but I think we need to reclaim it as, as that team sport and that collective responsibility rather than just the onus being on the individual. Um, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox on that. Is there, is there anything else anyone wants to come in about resilience before we maybe take another question? No. Nope. No, I think reclaiming it would be good. It's a bit like um, the service versus training debate, that service somehow has become a pejorative term, when service mm -hmm. is about looking after the needs of others. And that's the real essence of what medicine is all about. So um, I think language can get in the way. Mm. So more about what is it that we want to happen and I think that there's a lot about how we change the system within which we work but at the same time looking after each other but looking after ourselves as well but noticing when we are out of balance when we are struggling and then doing something about mm. it as opposed to perhaps the bury our head in the sand um, and hope it will go away mm. I think that's um, when things can implode much more than if we had perhaps nurtured ourselves a little bit and each other a little bit more. Okay, shall we take another question? Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, well, this is a good one. I think we've talked about this already a little bit. Um, so, is well-being the responsibility of individuals or the organisation? That's a good question. A bit of both. I would say both, and I think probably moving on you know the, the conversation we've just had about resilience the system and the individual and I think and the team I think we all go together I don't think you can have one or the other and there is something about knowing your team isn't there just mm. teams are very fluid now um, but just taking a moment to you know introducing you know who, who each person is 
a little bit about them and again just noticing if someone um, seems to be a little bit out of sorts or not. I just, it makes that gesture, often it's just a gesture, can make a world of difference. Mm. Yeah, Indeed. I think yeah. it's almost like a domino effect, isn't it? If, if your team um, that you're working in has good well-being, then you're naturally going to have good well-being yourself. But also you need to be in a team that is able to say to you, right, you're allowed to go away and look after your well-being right now. Um, because quite often I've seen as a medical student, you know, sort of groups I work with, um, you know, sort of the well-being isn't so great and, and sort of it's, it's very fragmented. And then people go away and feel like they can't, like they don't have the opportunity to look after themselves. Um, and so I agree with you. I think it is, it's, I agree with both. Yes. It's, it's a two-way thing. The, well, the organisation's got to live mm. what they say. And I think that it's, it's, it's very easy to say something. It's very much tougher to do. Yeah, I think, I think for me, it's very much a two-way street. So for the individuals, I think, I think one piece of advice I would give, and, and I hope and um, would like to see good organisations that really take this topic seriously, empower everyone to basically say, these are my boundaries, my personal boundaries, beyond which my well-being could be effective, uh, affected. Rather. I think similarly on the organisational front, where it's that two-way street, I would like to see much more of organisations saying, this is how we're going to look after our staff and doctors. Um, and I think with that shared common objective to say, if we look after ourselves, if we look after the system, ultimately patients benefit, which is, I think, both entities' ambition. So I think you know, one thing I would really encourage a lot of people to do more of is, as I said, set those boundaries, but maybe just remind everyone or the powers that be that when you have debates about well-being, resilience or boundaries or whatever, is how, does, how do these actions, or what are we talking about, how does this affect the care that we give to patients? Because ultimately, that's everyone's shared aim, I think. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was something recently that I was reading on social media about doctors being denied tap water and being told off for, did you see that? For I saw that, yeah. Just absolutely bonkers. This poor F1 who'd been told off for filling their bottle of water for stealing tap water. I mean, that's absolutely bonkers. And as you said, that's not just the well-being of the doctor, that's not just the morale of the doctor, actually. Would you rather have a well-hydrated, well-rested surgeon or an ethetist yeah. or, or, or not? Yeah. So I agree, I think, I, I, I think it's very much joined up and happy, happy doctors, happy patients. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've done some work in the private sector where, you know, th there's a very clear understanding, um, so for example, consulting companies that, you know, they have now dedicated departments that look after employee well well-being and when I was able to engage with those organizations I was actually just blown away by that simple concept of having a function that solely advised the management and the entire organization about how do we look after our employees because they understand the fact that happy employees means productive employees and ultimately you know keeps their customer happy you know if I paraphrase that to the health system keeps patients happy and, and out of hospital and you know and safe and well which is what everybody wants difficult because I think there are some trusts that actually do this very well mm. yeah. within the constraints of you know the health service everywhere is under pressure but there are some trusts that actually really do go out of their way to look after doctors and then there are others which which perhaps don't so I, I don't know what the difference is well d d so just on that maybe I could ask a question is, is why is that not consistent across yeah. The health systems. Mm. Why is you one don't why is one little pocket able to achieve that, yeah. but other pockets cannot? I, mm. I don't know the answer to that. Because I think often it's down to an individual championing, and it may be that they've taken that role on and grabbed it. Mm. So we, very selfishly, are doing lots of work now, looking about how, as the college, we may um, perhaps open up the conversation about the menopause. So it's not a surprise that the menopause happens, but it's not something that people necessarily feel comfortable talking about. Mm -hmm. So I am talking about it a lot more, and by doing so, have discovered places like Sherwood Forest who are doing extraordinary things in that space. So we um, are going to be profiling that again within our resource, and but then looking to see what practical things can we do to support doctors and the teams within which they work and those that work with those who work with the menopause, because I think probably a little bit more understanding about what that feels like, but what can you actually tangibly do? Um, those are the really important 
things to, to go forward. But I do think within organizations, often it is the individual, not necessarily um, that this is the, the culture through the organization. But we need to learn from each other mm. because those, I think, surfacing those case studies, you know, they're really good stuff. Why not share and see then, then how do we take that, but how can we implement it in our own local context? Mm. Mm. And again, I think it's the more we share, and again, more stories we share, yeah. hopefully the more we can spread the ripple effect going yeah, through. And this, this might be off topic a little bit, but um, I went to... Sorry, I went to the menopause. So. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a Schwartz round, I think yes. I'm saying that right, yes. Um, yes. before. And I was blown away because it was just where everyone sort of really opened up about some really sort of personally hard experiences. And, and there were quite a few tears in the room, but everyone's felt so much better after mm. it. And we, we, again, we felt in the same boat because we had all sort of gone through something quite difficult that week um, and it was just a, a sort of a, a way that as a team we brought all these experiences together in a like-minded way and I just I thought it was amazing and I just wonder if you know we can do more of them Absolutely. like you say with continuity sort of in, in all trusts in and medical the, schools and I think the, the the issue is with that so we we had through our, our learn not blame campaign which Dr Cicely Cunningham was was running she did an amazing job and we tried to to uh, empower sort of ambassadors on the ground to um, to create events like the Schwartz round where actually we could all learn because um, I think I think you're right the NHS as a whole it isn't great at learning from things that go wrong, but also the pockets of excellence and, and where actually things are happening locally um, that are really, really good. Um, and I agree, we need a bit more of a, a, a joined up culture. In fact, do you mind if I move on to the next question? Because it sort of Can I add yeah. that one of this bit about the organisation, one of the things is how do you create an inviting learning environment? And so, uh, just over a year ago, we published this resource, Never Too Busy to Learn full of practical, tangible stuff that you can do within your very busy working environments to create learning moments, or and they include how do you do a Schwartz round, but how can you do a pop-up Schwartz round? Because yeah. not everyone can get an hour away from their work or not necessarily feel comfortable sharing their stories to a big audience. Um, and Ashford and St Peter's, for example, um, is a great example of how they have taken that concept, but they've implemented to suit their staff. So there is, there's lots there. And really interesting yeah. To that up. That's really interesting. yeah, so if you Google never too busy to learn, mm -hmm. it, RCP, it will pop up. Um, and it's lots of things to ask the question yourself. How can I do this in the, the, the environment I'm working in? And very much both about um, the learner, but those who are teaching. Um, <laughs> and getting away from the concept everything has to be in a classroom mm. for it to be a learning moment. Mm. Mm. Um, but even just reframing how you do a ward round or asking questions, one of the greatest things that one of the, I think it was one of the chief registrars said, I really wish that there was a medical student on every ward round we were on, because when there is a medical student, the whole, the teaching happens, yeah. we get asked questions. Mm. And just Reframing that in your mind when you're doing a ward round can really start to change something. And people value um, that learning environment. That's where you feel good about what's going on around you. Mm. So there's lots of aspects to well-being. So mm. I, don't, I think it's more than just thinking about spaces, which are really important, connecting. But it is actually that you feel that you're turning up to, to work and you're, you're there for your own growth and development. Change your mindset. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think the next question, you've answered that actually really nicely already, um, is how can, well, lower level staff, <laughs> not sure about that, but uh, I guess how can more junior staff positively influence well-being and culture? So we've had some really good examples from you, Emma. I just wonder, uh, Amandeep and Alex, whether you have any examples that come to well, mind? I think it's just about treating everyone as the same and everyone to feel uh, equally part of that team um, because I think it's so easy for medical students you know just picture being on the ward round we're trailing at the very back because that's just how it works it's it's to, to feel involved um, and to feel included I think really really helps um, because then you feel like 
you're more sort of um, satisfied that you're contributing something. And again, it goes back to the whole learning environment where you feel a part um, of that. So I think really it is, it's, it's not looking at people necessarily solely just as them in their roles, but you know, sort of what can this person give to the team and what can this person contribute? Um, so yeah. Um, Amanda, I know you're doing a lot of really good work in the area with doctors in distress. I don't know whether you're able to share some of the work perhaps that you've been doing. Um, so very on the spot, thank you. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. I, so, so something that I, with the organisation, really are passionate about is very much around doctors' wellbeing. And I'm sure everyone can look at the website, but, but the real inspiration was it was my brother, who was a member of this college. and. I think, as I said at the outset, he um, he died by suicide in November 2018 uh, after a burnout phase, which um, he really suffered in silence and you know ended his life in a very tragic way. And I realised very very quickly that he wasn't the only one. And you know the, one of the reasons why I'm sitting in this chair today, al along with you know everyone who's contributing, is is to make sure that people learn from stories like his. Um, and I think I think some of the key learnings that we've tried to promote through the organisation around publicising the story is, is really based around three things. So number one is removing stigma. So just eradicate stigma, talk about things, talk in a very open, transparent manner because my brother felt that he couldn't um, because of the institutional culture within the profession and the health system. So I've written blogs, um, I've had the fortune and misfortune to be on TV um, and you know, esteemed events like this. Um, but also secondly, you know, we're very, very keen to make sure that cultures and behaviours change. And going back to the original question about, and I'll put in speech marks, low-level stuff, I think everyone has a role to play. And I think very much it needs to be a top-down, sideways-in, bottom-in, centre-out, an entire you know, a, a spheric approach to you know, changing cultures. And that, that, I think, for me, certainly comes about through eradicating stigma by talking openly. So I would encourage people at all levels to be role models, be the change that they want to see um, in the organisation that they're in going forward. And that way, behaviours will change, you know, slowly. And, you know, my hope is really at your sort of generation and level, Alexandra, is, you know, for the medical students and the future doctors going forward, um, you know, I think things will be a very, very positive state, you know, in, in 10, 20, 30 years' time after I'm long gone. But, but for me, I think the third thing that we probably haven't touched on fundamentally but we've alluded to is the value of strong, positive and compassionate leadership. So, so those are really the three objectives that you know, my organisation tries to work through and through my brother's story and, and very sadly other stories that are very, very similar hopefully can be learning points to improve you know, doctors' well-being, organisational well-being and as I always say you know, quite passionately, it's always for the patient and about the patient and this is actually a very, very good way of, of improving patient care and what, I can say this because I'm not going to get struck off by the GMC because I'm not registered but what really sometimes amazes me with a lot of doctors is over the years, over hundreds of years as the profession has been in existence, it will learn new techniques, new surgical procedures, learn about new drugs, new therapies. But its culture and behaviour and the mindset hasn't moved on at the same rate of change. And I just ask the question, well, why is that case? You know, I think the profession and maybe we need to ask ourselves, you know, why is that case? Is, is that something that's holding us back as healthcare professionals in helping our patients better. Um, I think that's time for another debate on another session. That will probably take quite a while, but hopefully that, that mm. gives you some insight into okay. what we've been trying to do. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I really liked what you said about sort of removing stigma, um, because I think once you remove stigma, um, you immediately feel more valued. Um, and I think something like well-being, it, it's an invisible thing, isn't it? Mm. Um, and we are so used in, in everyday environment now to just stereotype people by who they are, like their title, what they look like, etc. Um, and that's actually why I started basically the NHS campaign, you know, just kind of collecting portraitures of anyone and everyone in the NHS, not just doctors, but porters, nurses, midwives, um, cleaners, cooks, anyone. Um, because I think once you do that and we're all on the same page, quite literally and metaphorically, you all feel the same um, and, and it's great because it does make you feel more valued. And, and I think like you were saying with the whole stigma thing, it makes it easier for people to open up to each other um, because they don't think of each other as, um, based on their job title 
or their position. Um, they just humans. see each other as yeah. just another Fully member humans. of the team. Yeah. And you're both doing, you know, you're both doing amazing things. So I think the answer to this question is actually anyone can positively influence culture. Um, I mean, I, I suppose the only thing I've got to share is that <coughs> dub double tap strategy, which uh, we talked about earlier. But I think quite often we go to our colleagues and we notice something's not quite right or a bit off, and you say, you know, are you okay? And everyone goes, I'm fine because we're British. But you know, that's what everyone always says, and actually, you know, they're not fine. And actually, it probably takes a lot of courage. But I say, ask again. And the phrases I've got in my head are, oh, you know, are you really okay? Or are you sure? You just don't seem yourself lately or would you tell me if you weren't and actually the, the stuff that I've been doing on on moral injury so the psychological harm that happens to healthcare staff when they perhaps aren't able to give patients the care that they need due to system restraints we know with moral injury that people need to talk about stuff more than once mm. so I say to people you know if you if you do the double tap and you still get and I'm fine but you know they're not you know, give them a few days and ask them again yeah, I, I, I think that's brilliant. Sorry, but I, I was going to say with a double tap, I would suggest even taking that to the next step and even saying something like, look, I can tell something's not right. When you're ready to talk to me, come and find me and we'll have a conversation. And I think that leaves it open and encourages people to really then double, you know, even more come forward. You're right, it's just opening that door, isn't it? Yeah, I, I do, you know, we kind of do that every day anyway, but with our patients, we are always doing it continuously. So if we can do it with our patients, why, why can't we do it with... Our team, you know. That's a great question. We need to do it with our members of the staff. We're a caring well, profession, I think. I think, sometimes. Mm. We're not as caring as mm. we could be. Mm. And I think your point's really important as well, because I think anyone can open that door and anyone yeah. can and should ask that question. But, you know, you, you may not always be the right person or they, or they may not open up to you. And I think, like you said, um, sometimes it might just be saying, you know, to a colleague or a consultant, you know, I'm really worried about so-and-so. Would mm. you mind just following up with them and I think yeah. I think that's really important as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Should we take another question? Mm. Yeah. You're all good. Okay. Um, how do we move from tokenistic efforts to improve well being, i.e. one off mindfulness sessions to meaningful change? So I it's interesting how that question is worded. Mm. I'm a great believer in the aggregation of marginal gains, so I think that lots of small things can make a big difference and that we shouldn't dismiss some people's efforts to try and improve how work feels or the life around them um, but that's not taking away that it might be a little a little bit here in a big system problem so i think it's about that you're doing things together and i think there's the importance of being an ally of people who are trying to make a difference and rather than diss them and be dismissive, that that may work for some people. It may not work for you, and that's okay, but it may work really well. Pilates may work really well for some people. I wouldn't go near it. Um, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> so there are all sorts of things in that. I think it's, it's about how do you have a, kind of describe a smorgasbord of all different things that you can, that you may or may not work, but the big system making, sure that the system's working in the right way is then that's um, different ways that you way different approaches that you may take to make that better so that might be how you influence policy governments medical student numbers um, recruitment retention um, and those are big ticket items but sometimes some people don't have that influence to be able to do that bit but they do have the influence to change the environment that they're in so I think we make room for all but being very cognizant that yes mindful isn't going to help with the rotor gap but it might make you feel better after the the night shift that you've had just to restore yourself a little bit as you pick yourself up and off you go again so I, I I think you raised some great points there, and I agree to a, to a point, but I think how I sort of read that question, I think for me that needs to be aimed more at those in leadership positions. And I think, I think yeah, mindfulness, yoga, I think that's great, but sometimes it can be not misused, but as a way of just avoiding the actual root cause of an issue and being able to cope with something on a very, very short-term basis. 
but may not address whatever the long-term root causes are. So I, I would really throw that question back to those um, in the profession that are certainly in leadership positions to say, okay, so you're putting together tokenistic, let's have a yoga session at half seven in the morning before we have a changeover, what it, whatever you wanna do. Ask yourself the question, you know, how meaningful is that? If that was a patient and you treated them in just a, let's just to have a token and uh, a, a token treatment or, or whatever you decide, I can't think of a very good example. Are you actually doing the best by your patient? And I think you have, he hit the nail on the head. If we can treat our patients with ultimate care and compassion in a way that gives them the best outcome, we should be doing that to ourselves and our colleagues. And I think, I think that for me is actually one of the biggest challenges that those in leadership should actually throw them at themselves and say, are we doing the best job that we can with our staff in the way that we should and be able to do so? I agree. I think, I think you're right. We need to celebrate everybody's efforts. And some of that is wellbeing projects. And I, I certainly think they have their place. I just... I think the frustration comes often that there are these these system issues and that you know yoga or pilates is put forward as a as put forward as something that's going to fix it and actually it's not I read an email from a from an emergency medicine doctor um, who was really really stressed. They were really short staffed. They were really really short uh, short on the shop floor and you know she she did put her hand up and she did say do you know what like I I'm, I'm really struggling here. We're we're so short staffed. I just you know. I'm finding things really tough. And they emailed her back to say that they'd booked her in for a mandatory <laughs> wellness, uh, wellness and resilience session for an hour on the one day off that she had that week. Um, bless her, and she, and she forwarded that email to me. And you know, I think that really epitomizes the, the issue. I, I, like, I absolutely agree with you. We do need to celebrate any pockets of good practice, but you know, it's not gonna fix those overall system issues. But I think it's what's within your circle of influence, influence. But, but what is it that you are able to do and that may still be that you want to voice concerns that you are you do speak up that this isn't working and that's really important to do so um, then it's the the layers I would say that as you're spreading your influence what can <coughs> you do to change the system in which we work um, so it's coming from a slightly, I think I was just don't want to be dismissive of the fact that some people are working really hard. But if that's the organisation's only solution to rotor gaps and the front door coming in ED, then there are serious, serious issues. And that probably isn't the organisation that you want to be working in, nor do you want to be a patient in. Mm. I think that though that where it is looking after the staff, looking after the patients, the heart, which is often where you see a really fabulous education and research environment, is then the place that you want to work and be a patient. So, so just on that, so, and, and pardon my naivety, but w what would you say to anyone watching this who is a doctor in that environment? Because, I mean, I'm a pharmacist by background, so I understand the value of or the interaction with patient care as being the sole outcome, but you can't just walk away from patients. What, what about, what would you say to someone who I mean, your advice is, well, obviously may not you work in that environment, but how do you, I mean, I'll be keen to understand how do you manage that or how do you manage that emotion and, you know, obligation to the patient in, in, in that environment? I think... What would you say to a doctor watching I mean, that? Maybe, maybe it's a bit difficult for me to say as a medical student because I haven't quite sort of been in the field yet. But I totally get, um, I totally understand that people would probably be less inclined to take up these additional services because they know too well that these kind of these yoga sessions and Pilates sessions are literally being thrown in in the panic that actually we realise that the system is struggling big time. You know, there are more significant issues that we can't resolve imminently. However... I do think that I've, I've recently become a social prescribing champion and, and I think, you know, when there are patients where there might be the one drug that we can't sort of cure them with, we can, we can give social prescribing. So, you know, going to a yoga class or going to, to talk to other patients and, or going out to walk the dog, it might not resolve the condition, but actually it might help manage it. So I think that's kind of what you were saying, that it's these little things that, you know, marginally you can put together and, and it does make a difference. It doesn't resolve the, the bigger problems, but I still think that we should be sort of open our eyes up to sort of 
but I think, I think it's the challenges is when it starts to, to feel like you're normalizing the really mm. awful work environments because it's a sense of learned helplessness. You may have tried to speak up and got knocked back or nothing happens, or it is that someone puts a, brings around a tea trolley um, and that's the, the fix as opposed to needs a lot more. But again, it may be little steps in the right direction. But if you're really worried, I, you know, we have our Freedom to Speak Up guardians. There are junior doctors forums. There are, escalate it to your, uh, whether it your line manager, I would be relentless, persevere, um, be the voice that wants to, to make a difference and be part of the solution. It is very easy to complain about everything and everything and everything, but there is something about, okay, so if I was in the position where I've changed, what, what is possible? What might make a difference? So it's about working together and I think trying to get a bit away from them and us. You know, we're working really hard, them up there. Um, don't know what's going on. They've got their own challenges. Yeah. Um, so it would, it's that connectedness. That if we change, mentality. Yes, I think if we change the conversation and that we started to trust each other, but it's really difficult. If, you, if you've tried and you get knocked back, mm. you, and that's what happened in mid -stas. People tried and that learned helplessness happened. And that's the bit we've got to really try and prevent happening. So I wonder if we can just take one last question, um, and you've already mentioned several of these, but I wonder if the Royal College might have some more. Um, a question, what support services do you recommend? Do you have any others from the Royal College that you could make our... So the there is a um, huge <coughs> number of amazing support services out there. I have learnt so much. Who knew there was so much? But it is about who to access. and when you may be in distress and it may be that you need immediate help um, so when you go into the resource it that's really obvious you will then actually some of the first steps can often be that you need to register with a GP yeah. um, we're doing a lot around how to demystify occupational health for some that's almost like you're going to occupational health as a threat rather than actually what can they do for me or what can they do for me as a clinical manager how can I uh, how can we work together in the best way for the individual we're trying to support? And then there's a range such as the Practitioner Health Programme, um, other resources such as Doctors in Distress, but there's, then there are the generic services where you, you know, it's not about being a doctor, there are a whole range of other resources. But I think it is that you look within your own organisation, being paying attention to what is there, and that might be within the Trust Education Centre, it might be within the Deanery. Um, but in terms of, I think it's hopefully with this resource from the, the RCP, is that, that it's all there, and not least the BMA have done a whole lot about uh, support services, which are also geographically put into regions. Mm -hmm. So I think organisations are trying to work together to provide resources that people can access hopefully in the right way when they need it to get the right support and that's just sets them sets them hopefully off in the right direction and i think those extra resources are really good to know about because you might be in a situation where you find that your your institution or your deanery mm -hmm. maybe isn't as supportive as you'd like it and i think it is a bit of a postcode lottery in that sense but going back to when i was mentioning sort of social media earlier for me personally, that, that's been really, really good for me to sort of open up, you know, things like the tea and empathy mm -hmm. groups on, on Facebook and then Twitter, um, because you do, through that, you find there are other people in your situation. But, you know, actually going back to the very basics, you know, the side, uh, the resources and, and the groups on social media, your friends, your family, because actually they might not be able to resolve the problems, but just being able to rant about your bad day um, actually does help. It gets it out there. And I just think, you know, go to the people who are nearest and dearest to you. Mandeep, any other, so it's amazing, Doctors in Distress, which is being set up at the moment, which is, you know, a really wonderful charity. Um, but are you aware of any other support services uh, in your time advocating for doctors? Nothing that hasn't been mentioned. I mean, the, the two, I mean, I've seen some great work done by the NHS Practitioner Health Programme, um, which is, you know, um, had some great success, which is England-wide. I mean, just to clarify, so we don't interface or interact with doctors directly, but we have a web page on our charity that lists various resources. And I think you mentioned the BMA one have done 
they've done an amazing job of actually trying to localize and geographicalize all the local resources. So I would just urge people, you know, to, to have a look at those two resources. But whoever's closest, whoever's nearest and dearest, just reach out, you know, whoever's just to whoever you can and just I think as you put it, just have a rant and, and just speak out because, you know, again, referring to my brother's case, um, he suffered in silence and you know my ambition is that more and more doctors don't suffer in silence. So just find someone that you trust and, and you know that's the best first step. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and just to echo that, the, the BMA has got a really good list of resources. There's also uh, a list of resources on, on DA UK's page. And uh, if you are a fan of social media, I'm sure any one of us would always be happy to talk to you. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for joining this panel. It's been a really great discussion. Um, if you liked what you saw, uh, the RCP will be holding another panel on... February the 18th, uh, which will be another live panel where you can ask questions. Uh, and we'll also be holding another wellbeing in the workforce panel at the uh, RCP conference, Men uh, Medicine 2020. Hope to see you there. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the panel and uh, we will see you on the 18th.